you are the salt of the earth. From Matthew chapter 5, at verses 1 to 16. Well, brethren and sisters and young people, what we intend to do this evening is to go back perhaps to verse 7, just to pick up the last of those Beatitudes. I know we did consider these before, but with the interruptions in our class, very lovely interruptions of baptisms, of course, sometimes the mind wonders where we did finish. And I remember this week I had to ring up Craig and say, listen, Craig, what did I finish with last time? Because I couldn't remember either. And looking at my notes, of course, it doesn't necessarily uh, show me where I finished because we may get here, there, or somewhere else in those. But just so we won't miss anything, we'll just go back to verse 7, pick up the last few Beatitudes, and then move down to the end of verse 16 so that that finishes our section this evening. As we said before, brethren and sisters, these are marvellous things that we're reading of here. The Lord Jesus Christ, as we understand, of course, later on in Luke's Gospel, repeated this particular discourse, and hence there must be, in his mind at least, a very great significance and importance with it. The truth, brothers and sisters, is more than just a set of doctrines. It's a, it's a set of moral principles which are, of course, bound up with those doctrines. The doctrinal matters are the springboard from whence we operate and we practice those marvellous things which our Lord Jesus Christ not only taught us, but gave us the supreme example of. You know, brothers and sisters, I believe in the present circumstances of time, there are the, there's the opportunity for every disciple of Jesus Christ to discern what is the true principles of righteousness. At the present moment of time, in the turmoil that is in parts of this country, doctrinally, this ecclesia has a vital role to play. What are you going to do about it? Well, you know, you sometimes hear the expression, you know, you've got to strengthen the things that remain. Never mind about others what they might think. Let us hold fast to the pioneer writings. Let us stick to our inheritance. That, brothers and sisters, is easy. You preach that to me, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. It's easy to sit back on, on your laurels and say, well, we're all right, to heck with everybody else, as long as we stick to our principles. Is that what that Sermon on the Mount is teaching us? I tell you, nay. It's not teaching that at all, brethren and sisters. It's teaching us true to be pure, to be righteous, to be right, teaching all of those things. But that Sermon on the Mount was given by a man, brethren and sisters, who didn't keep that to himself, but gave his life to make certain that others at least would have the opportunity to follow him in that course. And that is the responsibility of this ecclesia. The answer to the problems is not to lock that door. That is ridiculous. That's easy. And I don't know of any course of action, brethren and sisters, in following our Lord Jesus Christ, that is easy. If you find, if you think you're following the principles of Christ, and you don't find that difficult, you're not following them. That is clearly obvious. You know, at the end of these Beatitudes, Blessed are ye when men shall revile and persecute you. They could have easily escaped that. They could have hid their light under a bushel, as later on he points out. That would have been easy. They could have had a light. They could have hid it under a bushel. It could have showed light to them and them only. But they were to be a city set on a hill. That's not easy. And so you find, brethren and sisters, in practicing these things, if we think we're following Christ, and your life is very comfortable, then you are not heading towards the kingdom of God. There's no question of that whatever. The life of discipleship is not easy, brethren and sisters. And let's never forget that. So when we start making these wonderful expressions, which seem on the surface to be ever so right, but they're ever so easy to do, they're the wrong thing. The right way, brothers and sisters, is God's way and the Lord Jesus Christ's way, and he never found anything easy. He had to go to death in order to demonstrate his father's righteousness. That was not easy. And so he says in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now we haven't found one of these Beatitudes that hasn't been solidly based in the Old Testament scripture. And I'm not going to turn these references up, because I understand we may or may not have been over this. I can't remember. But this we know, brethren and sisters, that that expression, blessed are the merciful, for they shall, inherit, for they shall obtain mercy, is taken from the comment in Psalm 18. To the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, said David. And what significance is in that? 
You know, you look at that psalm and you look at that expression. To the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. So that's obviously the comment that David is, that rather the Lord is taking from David's writings. But you know, when we rivet our eyes on that verse in the psalm, in the 18th psalm, we look at that and say, well, there's the basis for it. And we're looking at one verse. Let your eyes rove over that psalm. And look at the heading of that psalm. And it says, it's a psalm that David wrote when God had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And in the middle of that psalm, there's that expression, bless it, God will show himself merciful to those who are showed mercy. And if ever there was in a man's life, and he's dealing with another, that principle demonstrated, it was demonstrated in David's attitude to Saul. What a marvellous base, therefore, for that comment to be taken from. And didn't he find mercy, brethren and sisters? My word, he did. David found mercy of God a murderer and an adulterer, and yet he'll be in God's kingdom. And he said in that 51st Psalm, did he not, that when God forgave him, he would teach sinners in the way. He learnt the hard way himself, and he would teach sinners in the way. His nephew, brothers and sisters, never obtained mercy. His nephew, Joab, didn't obtain mercy for the opposite reason, because he never showed mercy during the course of his life. And in the end of his life, when he thought David was on his deathbed and he defected to Adonijah, David's son, and when Solomon, over, of course, took over the throne and he knew his life was in danger, he ran into the, into, the, into the holy place, did he not? And he clung hold of the horns of the altar in the court of the, of the tabernacle, hoping for mercy. And the horns of the altar spoke of the power of forgiveness. And it is a power. And as though four horns coming out of the the corners of the altar, they used to hang the sacrifices on them. So the significant factor was that when a man went in and grabbed the horns of the altar, he was, he was calling for God to exercise the power, which is the symbol of a horn, the power of forgiveness. And it is an enormous power, because when God forgives sins, brothers and sisters, it breaks the power of sin. And there was Job hanging on to that horn. And when they came back to Solomon and said, what are we going to do with that? He said, go in there and kill him. Now that was an extraordinary commandment because under normal conditions, brethren and sisters, even the basest of men would have got some consideration hanging onto the horns of the altar. Joab, none. Why? Because he had never, ever, ever showed mercy to anybody else. And so in the lives of those two men, David and Joab, that principle was shown positively and negatively and taken out of the 18th Psalm Upon, based upon all the experiences of David's life, how apt it was for that comment to be made in this context. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Taken, of course, from Psalm 24. Who shall ascend into the holy hill? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And the whole idea of, that, of, the, of the idea of purity here, brethren and sisters, you see from this comment here is that they that are pure will see God. See, God himself is pure. You know, when you think about that, it's, it worries me, it worries the daylights out of me, you know, you think about all your failings, you think, well, the word of God commands you to do this and you don't do it, and so you feel wretched about it. And it commands you to do that and you don't do that either, and it commands you to do this and you don't do that, and so on and so on. Then it commands you not to do that, and that's what you do. And so you go through your life like that, and you, get, you feel wretched. But you know, brethren and sisters, all those commandments are only stepping stones. They're only stepping stones. Because if we're told to do this or to do that, it's stepping stones to the top one which says, be ye holy as I am holy. That's the top step. So if we're making our way to God, by the time we get up there, if we're not pure in heart, we won't see him. We won't see him, brethren and sisters. Now no man hath seen God or can see God, we're told in the scriptures of truth. What will happen beyond the millennium is anyone's guess. No one has been told about that. But this we know. That when our Lord Jesus Christ returns, brethren and sisters, we will see in him all that God is. Now, who's going to be in his presence? Look at this quotation, which I didn't quote to you last time, which, which of course, was 
wonderfully opposite in this particular regard. Who's going to stand before our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And won't he be the manifestation of God? Look at the first of John chapter 3. Behold, John says, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Still turning the pages. What did I quote you? John did I? First of John, I meant. Chapter 3, is that right? First of John, chapter 3. Start again for you. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now there it is in a nutshell. So John says, we're the sons of God, brothers and sisters. We enjoy wonderful privileges. We often remind ourselves of that, of that fact from time to time. Brethren up here say, brethren, we've got a marvellous privilege to be in the ecclesia. It's wonderful. But it's true. But John says, we've got no idea what we will be. If we're the sons of God now, it does not yet appear what we shall be. Brethren and sisters, we shall be the sons of God. Not just because we enjoy the privileges of being an ecclesial life. Because we will be the sons of God. We will be consubstantial with the Father. We will have God's own nature. Our Father's own nature. But if that's going to be the case, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's going to be the case, it's going to be because we're going to be pure. And if we're not, we won't be there. Because we're going to be like him, we're going to see him as he is, and he is pure. And therefore, if we have the hope of that, brethren and sisters, we go about through the word of God, purifying ourselves. It's good exercise, you know. I find that you talk about visions of the kingdom. You don't have to have a... a a, a, a remarkable vision of the kingdom that takes you from the coming of Christ to the setting up of the, of, the, of the millennium and so forth and all the details, brethren and sisters. But, you know, you want to just think about some of the factors that are put before you here. We shall see him as he is. You think about that. I don't believe it's wrong to try and conjure up in our mind some of the splendour of that individual. Don't try and picture him according to the paintings you see the Catholics do of him. He's, got nothing, he's nothing like a Jew. Don't have to identify him in that way, brothers and sisters. But try and imagine what that's going to be like to see him as he is. Where is he now? How is, what is he? He's next to the Father. Right next to the Father. And he's going to be in the earth. And we are going to see him as he is. That is, if we're pure, because that's what he is. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that idea is last time, I think it was last time we conveyed the, we went through those various expressions and showed that that idea was in the book, in the Apocalypse, it was in the writings of Timothy, it was 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Everywhere that point was made about being pure, there is some allusion to seeing God. Who shall ascend into the holy hill? Who is going to go up to the holy place of the age to come and to stand in the presence of God in the person of Jesus Christ? He that's got clean hands and a pure heart. That's who. It's all got a question to do with the motive, brethren and sisters. The purity of that motive. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Is the next expression of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace follows purity. We learn that from James. First pure, then peaceable. Such as it is in the sermon, in the discourse here on the mount. Exactly the same. First purity and then peace. I think we went over that matter last time, brethren and sisters. You know, it's good. Blessed are the peacemakers. In the first chapter of James, of course, we've got a comment about that. As James takes up much of the discourse on the mount and expands it in his, in his epistle, 
in the third chapter of James it is. James tells us in chapter 3 and verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now, you know, brethren and sisters, I probably mentioned this last time. It won't hurt if I repeat myself again. Matter of fact, it'll do us all good. Do you know, the Australian characteristic is an extraordinary characteristic. I only had a evidence of that the other night. I commented it to a few brethren. We were in committee together, and it, it's an extraordinary characteristic. And you, you rarely see it in other people. But the Australian characteristic doesn't know how to make peace. We cannot disagree on anything amicably. And we can't do it. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. I've noticed it many, many years in my association on arranging uh, brethren's meetings and in various committees and in meetings with, with brethren around the country. We cannot uh, disagree on anything amicably. Other people can. And you know, if we intend to make peace, brethren and sisters, we've got to be able to disagree properly and not belligerently. You listen to an Australian. The arranging brother are going to talk about whether they're going to paint that wall black or white. And one brother says white. And the other brother says black. And they cannot put a different point of view amicably. The other night, I think it was the matter was, some trivial matter. It didn't matter that much. And a brother put forth his point of view as if he was going to chalk you in halves with his jaws. It was a trivial matter. You know, it's, it's an important thing in discussion with anyone that we have to have an objective. And James says here, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Now, when you sow something, you sow whatever you put in the ground, you're expecting to get so you want to get a certain thing. You make sure you put that kind of seed in the earth. And then with cultivation and watering, lo and behold, you produce what you sow. Now we're in discussion. As a matter of fact, the context of James chapter 3 is brethren who disagree. And James wants them to agree. He wants them to come to an agreeable uh, way of life. He doesn't want everybody, uh, of course, to, to believe different things. He's not talking about that. But when brethren are in discussion, he wants them to come to understand each other better. And if we've got a disagreement with a brother, and our objective is to get him to see our point of view, make sure you sow the right seed. This comment was made to be by a brother, a responsible brother. An incredible comment. He said this, and these are his exact words. He said, John... He said, when, we got, when I've got discussions on matters like that, he said, what I do, I throw a controversial subject in the middle, he said, and that sorts them out. That is the exact opposite of what that is saying. He throws a controversial subject in the middle, and that sorts them out. Well, that's an incredible comment, brethren and sisters. That is an incredible comment. Or we write someone a letter and we say, this, that, everything else, now make up your mind. Whatever the brother replies, that's his responsibility, is it? Or is it our responsibility? There's other ways of doing it without, without prostituting your principles, brethren and sisters. There are many, many ways of doing things without transgressing a single vital principle. It can be done ever so easily and yet ever so firmly. But if you've got the objective of peace in your mind, you'll sow it in the right way. You'll say it in the right way You'll encourage people to see your point of view and you'll never give up trying to make them see it gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Don't give away nothing. No hypocrisy, but it can be done the right way. And that's what James is talking about. And I believe that's what our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about. Blessed are the peacemakers. People who actually make peace. They make it. Peace doesn't come, brethren and sisters. It's made. God is going to make peace with this whole world. Jerusalem will be a city of peace. He will make peace. But he'll do it 
in a way that will get people to see that point of view. And those who won't will be destroyed. But there will be an opportunity for all the nations to see God in his right light and to be understood and to, and to, and to understand him and to come to that point of view whereby he will make peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was said. He is our peace, having broken down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. And there never was a more powerful fortress than that middle wall that divided Jew and Greek. And he broke it down. Why? Look how he did it. You know, often we use that expression as we meet together in committees when we know we're going to have vital matters to talk about and there may be some strong disagreements and the chairman will say, Brethren, I appeal to everyone to be Christ-like. And they're not wrong in that appeal. Blessed are the peacemakers. And we pointed out, brethren and sisters, that they are the children of God. And we we'll hope you went to that exercise I gave you of looking up seven references where God himself is called the God of peace by the apostle in seven times in his epistles he calls him the God of peace and in every context it deals with God as being the father of those who are at peace with one another. If he's the God of peace then the peacemakers are his sons. That is a wonderful, wonderful, logical truth. If he is the God of peace then the peacemakers are his sons. And we pointed out the one of the most wonderful expressions in the prophets of the Lord Jesus Christ was that he would be the Prince of Peace. For unto us a Son is given, the Son of the God of Peace. And he became Prince of it and became our peace and broke down that middle wall of petition. Now back in that, having summarised those three, back in that the discourse on the Mount, we pick it up now in a more detailed manner, brothers and sisters, Notice what he says at the end. All the way through, of course, it was blessed are they, are they and blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, and so on. But now down in verse 11 we read, or, uh, yes, verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all men of evil and falsely for my name's sake. So here is the application. Blessed are ye. And you notice, brethren and sisters, that comes at the end when in verse 10 he talks about those who are blessed, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now notice the repetition of that in verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil falsely against you falsely for my sake. Now notice the equation. So at the end of the Beatitudes, is it, it's summarised in this way, that blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And then Jesus turning to these disciples and said, blessed are ye when you're persecuted for my sake. Look what he's saying. Look what he's saying. He is saying, brethren and sisters, that he is the epitome of righteousness, isn't he? So when he makes that personal application to them, he makes the personal application of the moral attributes to himself. So where has it run through the, 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 the discourse in the third person? Now he applies it to them in the first person. Blessed are ye when you do this for me. And there's the application, isn't it, brethren and sisters? And if they're going to follow the example, surely here it is, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But you know it's something deeper than that again? It's not only an equation between for righteousness sake and for my name's sake, but you see, he again is quoting the Bible. And where would he be quoting the Bible at the end of this discourse? Where else would he be quoting this than at the very end of Isaiah's prophecy? Because it's been in Isaiah's prophecy nearly all the way through. And so you come back to the 65th chapter of Isaiah, brethren and sisters. 66th chapter of Isaiah, I'm referring to. And you will remember that a couple of times we quoted this chapter in relation to the poor in spirit. And how does Isaiah finish his prophecy? Verse 5 of Isaiah 66. Hear the word of Yahweh, ye that tremble at his word. 
Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let Yahweh be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Isn't that Matthew chapter 5? Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you for my sake. Whose sake is it in that verse, brethren and sisters? For whose sake is it in that verse? That hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake. That's the expression of our Lord. That's where he's getting it from. And who's the name in there? It's the name of Yahweh. See what he's doing? So when the personal application of the, of the Beatitudes comes to the end, he says, Blessed are ye if you follow the example of me. And quoting Isaiah 66, he's telling them that I'm following the example of my father, Yahweh. That's what he's saying. And by stepping stones back to Isaiah 66, there it is. And there were brethren in those days who trembled at God's word, who looked downcast, as the early verses had said, and felt depressed because they couldn't look to heaven and say, Lord, I fast twice in the week and pay tithes to the poor and so on. They couldn't do that. But they came before God and without looking up to heaven, they said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And those who could come in, looking into the sky, as if they were the criterion of righteousness, said to these poor wretches, listen you, get out. You're a disgrace of the truth. They said that, brethren, and said they hated you and cast you out for my name's sake and they threw them out in the name of God. But, says the prophet, Yahweh will be glorified, he will appear to your joy and they will be ashamed. And when those disciples came down from that hill, brethren and sisters, the scribes and Pharisees would have eyed them off and they would have spat at them and they said, fancy, fancy, former disciples of John the Baptist and followers of your religious leaders, fancy following back this itinerant carpenter. What would he know about the law? And many of them later on were cast out of the synagogue. Never mind, said the Lord Jesus Christ. Never mind. Rejoice like the prophets did. And he had in mind that prophecy there. There's no doubt about that. Now, brethren and sisters, let's come back to that fifth chapter of Matthew and see what our Lord immediately goes on with, having finished the section of the Beatitudes. Straight away, he calls all those who follow in the, in the footsteps of himself and of the prophets, he likens them in verse 13 to the salt of the earth. Now, I believe that is very, very significant. Why would our Lord, in the beginning, you might say, of that discourse, when he's now going to speak about very vital issues arising out of those earlier ones, why would he choose to refer to the symbol of salt. Well, you think about it. What is salt? Well, it is, brethren and sisters, it must be the absolute basic commodity for cooking. It'd have to be, wouldn't it? Of all the condiments, salt is the absolute basic condiment as far as cooking is concerned. What does salt do? It's a white powder. A pinch of salt put into whatever the woman is cooking, what happens to the salt? It dissolves immediately, very quickly. It's gone out of sight and the mind. It's, it disappears into the water. You don't see it anymore. But it permeates everything. It gives that tang, that tastefulness to everything. It mixes with everything, but you can't see it. Salt, brothers and sisters, is a preeminent uh, symbol for motive. That's what it is. And the Lord is going to talk about motive all the way through John, the Matthew 5, 6 and 7. He's going to talk about motive. Ye are the salt of the earth. In goes the salt. It disappears out of sight, but it's in everything. It permeates the lot. It's not one of those things you see once it, is, it, it dissipates in liquid. It's gone, but it's there. And it's the substratum of everything that's being cooked. It is the basic condiment. So it speaks of the hidden motive. And that's exactly what he's going to talk about. It's also, brethren and sisters, a symbol of consistency, as we will see. Salt is a consistent chemical. It is one of the most consistent chemicals known to man. And it's a symbol, as we will see later on, of incorruption. 
It is therefore, when you put those things together, a wonderful symbol of a good and a pure motive. A pure motive, brethren and sisters, can't always be seen, it's hidden, but it permeates the whole doings of a person. It is always consistent and it is always directed towards preserving truth, preserving something. That's what it is. Now, did you know that salt was added to all the sacrifices? Jesus made reference to that in Mark chapter 9. Ye are the salt of the earth, he said. Now, he made reference to this in Mark chapter 9 and verse 49. He said, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. That's a quaint expression, brethren and sisters. But wait, what does it follow? Well, it follows verse 48. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know where that's taken from, don't you? That's taken from where? Isaiah 66. Let's have a look at that. So everyone is salted with fire, and every sacrifice is salted with salt. And then he says, or rather he's had just, he just had quoted the words of Isaiah 66. The last verse of the prophet says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall the fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Now the Lord had just finished dealing with Isaiah 66. Now he said, look, everyone shall be salted with fire, and others that sacrifice will be salted with salt. So the, the, the issues at stake in Isaiah 66 are salt or fire. Now you put salt in something and it permeates it. It gives a taste without which it's tasteless. And you put something in fire and it destroys it. There's a totality about those two things. One for preservation and the other one for destruction. And in verse 18 or verse 16 of this prophecy we read, for by fire and by sword, Yahweh will plead with all flesh. And those people who will not bow to his will, brethren and sisters, and who are hypocrites, will suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. Their worm will never die because they will go into everlasting destruction. They will be overtaken by the element of fire. Why? Because if you look back in the early verses of chapter 66, especially in verse 3, you will note there, they were running around making sacrifices that had no salt in them. He that killeth an ox, is this if he slew a man? He that sacrificed a lamb, as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offered an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood. And because there were sacrifices being made in Israel, with no purity of motive, no consistency, and no element of preservation, they were salted with fire. And if people are not consistent in the truth, they will be consistent in the grave. That's the message of Isaiah 66. If we're not consistent with God's principles, we'll be consistent with the worms. If we're not eaten up with the zeal of God's house, we'll be eaten up with the worms. That's the, the message of Isaiah 66. And so the Lord has just finished that. And he says, everyone will be salted with fire, having just quoted that prophecy. But he says, the sacrifices will be salted with salt. Now come back to Mark chapter 9 and the Lord then brings that point very personally down to them as to the symbol of the salt. Now I want you to notice his application, brethren and sisters, of the principle of salt, what it meant to him. Listen to it in verse 50. Now he says, salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Now, let's just comment upon that. You know, it has been said by critics that the Lord knew nothing about chemistry because salt is a consistent chemical and it will not break down under any circumstances. It's not true, brethren and sisters. Actually, it is true, as the, some scientists have shown, that true, treated salt won't do that, but rock salt could. If rock salt, through moisture, picks up ingredients, picks up some of the 
particles of dust into the earth, it will weaken that salt. And that's what the Lord is talking about. He's not talking about refined salt. He's talking about, ye are the salt of the earth. He's talking about that rock salt that they had all around the Dead Sea. They had tons of it. That could break down. You want to beware of that, he says. You're the salt of the earth. Now, he says, I've shown you from Isaiah 66, you're either salted in fire for destruction, or if you've made a pure sacrifice, if the motive is good, every real sacrifice is salted with salt. And that's what Leviticus said. Thou wilt not suffer the salt of the covenant, it says, to be missing from the sacrifices. It made that comment. Every sacrifice under the law of Moses had a pinch of salt in it. I'll show you why in a moment. But now let's look at the Lord's exposition of what salt meant to him. He's talking about good salt. Have salt in yourselves and peace with one another. See the point, brethren and sisters? You know why he said that? Go back and have a look at verse 33 and 34. This is what was going on prior to this comment. He came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them what, what it was what it was that you disputed among yourselves by the way. But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. So the Lord, going through the discourse and taking a little child and demonstrating the principle of humility, brought them to this point of Isaiah 66, where there were in Isaiah 66 two classes of people. The super-religious who exerted from their very presence an aura of righteousness and were offering swine's blood as far as their motive was concerned and a poor little group of people who were so depressed and overcome with their own weaknesses and faults that were howled out by others and said, get out of Yahweh's sight. There were two classes in that chapter, brothers and sisters. And here these disciples were taking the part of the first class and arguing all the way down from, from Capernaum as to which of them would be the greatest. Nobody was claiming to be the least like Isaiah 66 was talking about. And so the Lord gave them a lesson of humility, brought them to that grand prophecy and pointed out to them they needed salt. Where did they need it? They needed it in themselves. Let's take a pinch of a good motive. Pure crystal white. The word of God, the essence of sacrifice, brethren and sisters. Let's take a pinch of that and swallow it. Let that go deep into our hearts and minds. Let every member of the Enfield Ecclesia, and any Ecclesia, but using our own for the purpose of our illustration, let every member of our Ecclesia come through that door with a pinch of salt in them. And I'll tell you what you'll get in this hall. Peace among everybody. And as soon as you hear a measure of discord in this hall, it'll be for the reason only that somebody is in here without salt. There's a sacrifice in here of swine's blood. There's a sacrifice without taste without flavour, unacceptable to God. There's somebody in here who hasn't got a pinch of salt in themselves. If they did, did, then there would be peace among us. That's his point. It's a beautiful point. Because if salt goes for the hidden motive, if it's consistent, and if it, if it tries to preserve, it will produce peace. That will be the product. And so that was the way the Lord expounded that. Now why did they put salt in every offering? Well, we won't turn the reference up, because you probably remember from about 20 years ago, in our Law of Moses studies, we pointed out time and again that when the law spoke about the portions of the sacrifice which went upon the altar, which God accepted in fire, and the bread of the offering, it was noted as, in the margin, the food of the offering. And we can simplify, Malachi did, you know, you can speak of all the intricacies of the law, but it's very simple, and Malachi simplified it for us, Actually, the law was nothing more than this, that the altar was God's table where he ate, and you served God first with the right portions, the very best, and when God had participated in that sacrificial meal, then everybody else joined in. That's how families used to be brought up when parents were more dignified and children more respectful. No one, no one in our house ever, when I was a child, ever would lift the knife and fork for my father, because if you did, you'd wake up in the middle of next week. Good. And he wasn't in the truth. But that's how we were brought up. When I was a child, I remember you wouldn't do that. And you know, that's not 
for the right reasons perhaps. But as far as the law of Moses was concerned, the priest went there and he, he put that upon God's table. Would you put God's food on the table without salt in it? Would you? Would you dare? What does a sister do when through much cumbered about with serving she forgets and has visitors home for lunch? A lovely meal, no salt in it. Oh, <gasps> dearie me. Rushes to the cupboard, out comes a salt shaker, <laughs> tries to, to make up the loss. It's never quite the same, is it, brethren and sisters? You either get too less or too, too, too much. It's never quite the same. Would you serve God without salt? No, you wouldn't. You'd make certain it was in. So as the law said, they would have put salt in all the sacrifices. You would not serve God that meal without salt. Not, of course, that you, know, you think that God is actually eating that food. He's not. God is beyond that. But it symbolises, brethren and sisters, your offering of your life to God. Would you give your life to God with an impure motive? Would you? Would you dare to come here Sunday morning and sit in the, and occupy a chair with an absolute impure motive? Would you do that? Well, brethren and sisters, some in Israel did, and they were salted with fire because of that. Salt is a symbol of permanency. Back in Numbers chapter 18, rather interesting. You know, the disciples would have known all this when he said, ye are the salt of the earth. You think about this, brethren and sisters. Here in Numbers 18, who are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with the charge of the priests and the Levites and the portions that they ate. So Numbers 18 is dealing with the parts of the sacrifice that the priests and the Levites had. Nobody else, the priests and the Levites. Now we read in verse 19 of Numbers 18, All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto Yahweh have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee by a statute forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before Yahweh unto thee and to thy seed with thee. So here was the portion of sacrifice called the heave offering, right? Now what did that signify? Well, there were two basic portions of the sacrifice which were related to Levites and priests as representatives of God. And they were called, and rightly called in the authorised version, well rendered, the, either the wave offering, which went like that, or a heave offering, which went like that. If it was a wave offering and offered to certain people, it meant that they were dedicated to God's service. They were dedicated people to God's service. If it went like this, a direct offering, it was telling them that they were people who represented God to others. Ye are the salt of the earth, said the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says, I'm giving that to you as a covenant of salt. And up on top of that hill, brethren and sisters, there were men going every which way. They were dedicated to God's service and they were going to be given to the world to represent God to men. Ye are the salt of the earth. And he made that covenant with them. And the very fact that that heave offering and the wave offering were, in a, were very much related to God's own portion on the, on, the, on the table, it meant that what God had done was taken the very best of the sacrifice, in a sense, and shared that with certain people who represented him. Wasn't that what the Lord was doing? Nothing but the best was being served up on that mountain, brethren and sisters. Nothing but the best was being served up there. Ye are the salt of the earth. And they were going to go in and to permeate humanity with the message of the gospel and a pure motive. In the second of Chronicles, chapter 13 and verse 5, we got another reference to, the, to, the, to salt. And this time it's referred to the throne of David. David was the salt of the earth, brethren and sisters. So in the second of Chronicles, chapter 13 and at verse 5, we read these words. Ought ye not to know that Yahweh Elohim of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? Meaning that it was given as consistently to David. Wasn't that true, brethren and sisters? Did God give the kingdom to, as a covenant of salt to David? Well, he did, didn't he? Because look what he did. When the kingdom divided between north and south, up in the north, the kingdom in the north of the ten tribes, there were nine separate families shared that throne, one, one after another. And most of them took over the throne in a welter of blood. Nine different families. 
But down in the south, right through to Zedekiah, one family alone shared that throne, David's family, because God gave it to him and his sons as a covenant of salt. There was a consistency about that. And it was maintained right to the end. And beyond that, brethren and sisters, did not God say that even though David's sons might fail him morally, the day would come when God's mercy would never depart from David. And as Jeremiah, picking up that marvellous point of the second of Samuel 7, said, David shall never want a man to sit upon, to have sons to sit upon his throne. That the heavens and the earth depart to Jeremiah. David shall never want a man to sit upon that throne because God will give it to him as a covenant of salt. And who is it that will land on that throne, brethren and sisters? Who else but he who is the salt of the earth, Jesus Christ our Lord, whose purity of motive and purpose will permeate the world and go into people as a hidden motive inducing them to add savour to their lives and to all the people around about them having peace among themselves. Such was the wonderful covenant. Now I said salt was a symbol of incorruption. If you'd like to use two hands, turn up twin epistles. Colossians chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 4. We know these two epistles often use almost identical language, almost phrase by phrase is used in these epistles. So they're often known as twin epistles. You look at the different expressions and you'll see the symbol of salt coming out here, brethren and sisters. In Colossians chapter 4, let's take that first of all, and in verse 6, we read this. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now you just ponder that. Our speech is with grace, seasoned with salt. That means, brethren and sisters, that when we're talking about important matters, vital matters, we're not quick to speak. We think about it. We pause. We give time for the salt to dissolve, to permeate our thinking, to cleanse the motive, purify it, and that when we speak, it's calculated to bring forth the right result, seasoned with salt. Now that's the expression of Colossians. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29... We have the twin epistle making its comment where it says, and you'll see the similarity, Ephesians 4 and verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now that is obviously the twin comment. But instead of having let your speech be seasoned with salt, we have here let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now, if you want to preserve something from corruption, you put it in salt. You tan a hide. Not a child's hide, but a sheep's hide or something. You tan a hide. You, 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 you skin the animal, and when you skin it, brethren and sisters, it, you cannot get the skin off that clean. It's not going to leave traces along the back of the skin, of little pieces of flesh and flecks of blood and streaks of blood there. You've got to soak that. What do you soak it in? You soak it in, in, a, in a sort of a brine or whatever else they put in the... In the um, in the water to, to help that to preserve it. But before you do that, before you ever do that, if you're going to leave it overnight, you get that thing and you put a, almost a half a bag of salt on it. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble in the morning. But if you do that, you've got no worry. And I've seen it done. They pour the salt on thickly and then scrape it all over it. Then they get hold of the skin, they roll it up tightly and they stick it away and they can leave that for a number of days perhaps. And no worries. Corruption won't set in while that salt is there. It preserves that. Let no corrupt communication proceeding out of your mouth. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. So that when you put those two things together, there is the symbol of the salt. Now you think of those disciples. Ye are the salt of the earth. Look what it meant to them. It meant that they were called upon now to enter into a covenant with salt with God where God would be consistent with them if they would be consistent with him. They would learn from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ immediately after he said that that the motive always has to be pure and without corruption. They would learn, brethren and sisters, that they were now a sacrifice acceptable to God, truly salted with the salt of the covenant. And they would learn that God would share with them 
the wonderful benefits of sacrifice. He would share that with them. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, he laid down his life not only for his friends, but in order that he might redeem himself, brethren and sisters, there was a sharing of those things. And if Saul had not been in that sacrifice, they never would have peace among themselves. So when the Lord used that expression, I believe all of those things, and much more perhaps, was being conjured up by him, and later on that would become apparent to his disciples as they learnt more and more about those wonderful symbols that our Lord used. Now you want to conclude with that last one he used in Matthew chapter 5. You think about this. Not only were they the salt of the earth, brethren and sisters, but he told them that they were the light of the world. In verse 14 he said, Ye are the light of the world. Now brethren and sisters, it was the Lord Jesus Christ who was the light of the world. He said that in the 8th chapter of John, verse 12. He said, I am the light of the world. Now there's only one way that men can be the light of the world and that's by reflection. John talks about our Lord Jesus Christ in his first chapter in verse 9 in the gospel message of John. He said, this is the true light that cometh into the world which lighteneth every man. So every man is not a true light but he's lit up by that true light. And if we are the light of the world, brethren and sisters, we can only be that if we're reflecting somebody. And that somebody is our Lord Jesus Christ. When he said to them, therefore, ye are the light of the world, it was like saying, ye are the salt of the earth. He was sharing something with them. Because there's only one light of this world, and that is him. And we've seen the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, as Paul told us in the second of Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. And at the end of that chapter he tells us that we are but reflecting that light as in, a, as in a glass, as in an image, from glory to glory. We can only reflect that, brothers and sisters. But nonetheless, if we do that, we are the light of the world. Now in order to impress them with that, he went on and said to them, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Much has been said about the the position he would have been in then, and they say, well, perhaps he was near Saifed, which indeed sits on top of a hill and can be seen for miles away. But that's only an interesting phenomenon, brethren and sisters. What's the issue? The issue is that it's a city that is set on a hill. Now, in the age to come, that's what Jerusalem will be. Won't it? It's not now. It's only set on a hill from, from probably two or three advantage points. But because of the earthquake, which will elevate Jerusalem, it will be elevated so it will be seen everywhere, even on the sides of the north, as the psalmist said, when today it cannot be seen on the sides of the north. And when it's elevated to that position, it will be called Zion, which means conspicuous. And it will come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. It will be a city set on a hill. And so Zechariah calls it, in his 8th chapter and verse 3, the city of truth. It can't be hid. Now the point he's making is this, brethren and sisters, and this is a very telling point. It's a city that is set on a hill. That city is the truth. It's the truth of God's word. And it's set there by God. You're either in that city or you're not. But if you're in it, you're conspicuous. If you're not conspicuous, you're not in it. So Jesus is not here talking about the voluntary submission of a man to God's will so much. He's talking about the way that God has set it so. When a person is baptised, they must understand this, they're walking into a corporate body of people known as the Holy City, the New Jerusalem. It's on a hill, brethren and sisters. You can't be hid. God's put it there. Now you think about this. That point wouldn't have been lost on them, would it? That point wouldn't have been lost on them. Think about the circumstances. Think about it. There they were, on top of a hill. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went into the mountain and when he was set, his, his disciples came to him. And here he is talking to them. Different Greek word, but the meanings are similar. And there he is set on top of the hill. He's got a little group of disciples and the multitude are down below. Every one of that multitude would be able to identify one of those disciples. They'd all be saying, ah, ha, 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 yeah, Peter from Bethsaida, he's one of his followers. Oh, there's John and his brother James, Andrew and Philip, Thomas, and Bartholomew. They were sat on a hill, brethren and sisters. 
And if they didn't want to be set on a hill, they never would have heard him speak. They would have been at the base of the hill. When we choose to climb that mountain to listen to our Lord, brothers and sisters, we're conspicuous to the world. So he's talking about what God is doing. God is setting a city on a hill. If you want to get into that city, you've got to become conspicuous. If our belief is not conspicuous among our fellow men, brothers and sisters, we're down among the crowd. If in the age to come, we're going to be with our Lord Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem, it'll be on the top of a hill and all the world will see it. Won't be able to escape that. That's what God does. But now men do have a voluntary choice in the matter. Neither do men light a candle. Why do men light a candle? This is something that men might do, brethren and sisters. Why do men light a candle? Well, it's one thing for God to set the truth on top of a hill and to enter into it, but when we enter into it, it's like that we ourselves volunteer to light that candle. Men light a candle. What do they do with it? Why, why do you light a candle? You only light a candle for one thing. You light a candle to get light in the dark. Nobody says Jesus lights a candle and immediately puts it under a bushel so that there's no light given. What? That's just stupid. Why would you do a thing like that? Now here's an interesting thing, brethren and sisters. Men do light candles and put them under bushels. In the other gospel records, when he spoke about this lighting of the candle, he used another figure. He said men don't light a candle to put it under a bed. Isn't that interesting? And you go through the ecclesia, you go around the world, there are people who light candles to put under a bed and under a bushel. They're all over the place. You take the bushel, what's the bushel? The bushel, brethren and sisters, is the Greek word which indicates, as the margin says here, it's a measure. And the margin of my Bible says the word in the original signified a measure containing about a pint less than a peck. In other words, it would be a common household measure. And do you know, brethren and sisters, there is no more effective way to obscure the light in the ecclesia than by the cares of this life. And half your life, if not three quarters of it, are thinking about measurements. And that's where your light's gone. It's either measuring your economy as far as running your house is concerned, or getting yourself measured at the tailors or the dressmakers for the next lot of clothing you're going to get, or measuring your bank balance against the things to come, what you can do or what you can't do, or measuring the current interest rates, or whatever, but half your life is spent putting lights under bushels. You haven't got time to shine. There's too many measures over the top of you. And if that doesn't stop the light from shining, brethren and sisters, if it's not under a bushel, it's under a bed. Because we're too tired to do this, or we're too tired to do that, and probably far too tired because we've been too much measuring. And our light is hid under a bushel. So a brother come to me today and he said, Brother John, how do you go about studying? And I said, you just simply spend hours at it. He reeled back. That would be a shock to him because people don't spend hours at it. We've got no time. We're too busy measuring. Our whole life is measured off. We're forever measuring this, measuring that, and measuring something else, and we blunder about in the dark and know nothing about the daily readings because we've been measuring too much. Or we've been laying flat on our back because we're too tired to do this, or we're too tired to do that, or we're too tired to do something else. What two wonderful symbols was the bushel and the bed, brethren and sisters, to obscure a lie? People go on doing it all the time. And yet you look at it in the literal fact that it's ridiculous. And it is ridiculous. We live a ridiculous life. We are ridiculous people. This is a mad, mad, mad world. It's not a world, it's an asylum. We are crazy people, the whole lot of us. And when the Lord came tomorrow and brought a sudden stop to our life, we'd be out of breath with all the puffing and panting of things we're doing and they're not worth that much. And all that will be necessary then, brethren and sisters, is light. Think about that. What if tomorrow the Middle East blew up? What if America decided to take on Iran and to clear the straits 
and the golf there and get rid of all the, 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 the gunboats and the mines? What if they decided to back Iraq? What if Iraq pressed across the borders of Iran and the Ayatollah appealed to the Russians? What if the Russians went to war with them, brethren and sisters? What if, if Gorbachev considered time was no longer on his side and he crossed the Iron Curtain into, into Europe? What if he did that? What if all those things happened? And what if the angel knocked on your door and says, quick, 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 it's here, it's come. The hour has come, it's all over. It's all over. Where's your measure? Where's your bed? Where's your light? That's the point, brethren and sisters. And as our Lord was talking about those things, he didn't have a measure and he didn't have a bed. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. He didn't have either. And his light, brothers and sisters, radiated Judea and Galilee and the world around him unobstructed by any such things as the cares of this life or slothfulness. And they're the two greatest covers of light that I would know. Do you know in a Jewish house, the tradition had it, that they never let a lamp go out at night? You know that's in the, in the uh, attributes of the, good, the, the uh, virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. It says, her lamp goeth not out. It's in the 13th chapter of Proverbs and verse 9 when God says that there'll be light in the house of the righteous but the lamp of the wicked will go out. Only wicked people put their lamps out, brethren and sisters. Do you know that if God had a lamp burning in his house morning and night? That there was a lamp burning all night in the tabernacle? They trimmed that lamp and kept it going all night and that was the house of God? That's what every house in Israel was going to be like. They were marvellous symbols, but they were very simple symbols too, brethren and sisters. And in that holy place, there was the altar of incense, wasn't there? And it was made with a flat top and a battlement around the top of that. That's Exodus 22 and verse 8. Exactly the same, every house in Israel was like that. And so when they described the altar of incense, it was described with walls and a roof. Why? Because there in the, most holy, in the holy place was a replica of every house in Israel. So they used to go on top of their house and pray to God. And on that altar of incense, they put, of course, the incense which smoked unto God. Do you know what one of the, in the ingredients of the incense was, brothers and sisters? Salt! You learn that from Exodus chapter 30, and looking at the margin. Salt was in the, uh, in the incense, which was burnt as a symbol of prayer. And what did the apostles say? Be constant in prayer. Be consistent in prayer. Salt was in that. So all these things were in God's house. He had salt there. He had light there. He had that, he had that light there set on a hill, as it were, in the golden lampstand. The salt mixed with the prayers of the saints of Israel. And there was light in his house, and it never went out. There was no cares of this life in God's tabernacle, nor was there slothfulness. He wouldn't tolerate it. Men's lives are like that, brethren and sisters. Some men go through life like a light. Look at this one, Second Samuel 21. Here's a man who went through life like a light. Never got put out till he died. <laughs> David nearly got killed in this battle, as recorded in Second Samuel 21. He was an old man. He, he was getting beyond fighting the giants of the Philistines. And in verse 17 of Second Samuel 21, Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the lamp of Israel. Look at the margin, the candle, because it's not a candle, it's a lamp, the lamp of Israel. And there was a lamp that was lit, brethren and sisters, and that lamp never got put under a bushel, nor to get put under a bed. And in his old age, he still flickered among the nation. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to think about this, a wonderful thing. That in relation to the covenant of David, it was both said of that, that it was a covenant of salt, and in the 132nd Psalm it says, I will give David always a lamp in Jerusalem. There was, as it were, in those two things that our Lord brought before his disciples, attributes of David's life, where he had a consistent, incorruptible covenant between him and God, and he himself, always in Jerusalem, had a lamp there burning for him. And that lamp, brothers and sisters, may have been the lamp of truth, the promise of Messiah, as Psalm 132 says it was, but it nonetheless was personalised in the person of David himself, 
But here he is as an old man still flickering away in Israel. Why do men light a lamp? Isn't it, brothers and sisters, to give light to the house? Isn't that interesting? See, as far as we're concerned, we may be the light of the world. We preach the gospel from this platform. We tell the strangers about the covenants of promise. But apart from being a light of the world, reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, we're here to give light in the house. We've got to give light to the Ecclesia as well. We've got to set examples one to the other. We've got to inspire one another to greater heights in the service of our Heavenly Father. That's what we've got to do. And we've got to be bright and burning, never being quenched in Israel. That's the lesson of the Lamb. And so Jesus finishes that section by saying to his disciples in that fifth chapter of Matthew, he terminated that particular section by summarising those points In verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Brethren and sisters, it's as well to note that the emphasis as far as the light was concerned is on works. Generally, you know, we talk about light, the emphasis we generally put upon words. Jesus didn't. He says it's works. Your good works. And it is remarkable how that radiates light. It's quite remarkable. You you might know several people. You might have a lot to do with people. You might spend a lot of time with them. You might find one of those people can always talk to you about the scriptures. Have read Eureka consistently. And talks about it. Can quote you the Bible. But they don't act always as they should do. Another person may not be able to do that. They may have a a few hang-ups perhaps and perhaps a a reputation of things that are not so good because they can't talk the Bible. But sometimes they can show a remarkable attitude by their works. Quite an astounding attitude. And it's remarkable, brothers and sisters, which of those two lights comes over brighter? By your good works. That's where our light is. It's in the works. And if those lights are shown, then we glorify our Father, which is in heaven. That's wonderful. Our Father. You know what he's called, brothers and sisters, by James? He's called the Father of lights. See, because if there's any light at all in us, it's come from God, isn't it? There's no, as Dr. Thomas says in Elvis Israel, there's no such thing as light within. That's, that's a fallacy. There's nothing but darkness within man. Light comes from outside. It comes from God. He's our father, brethren and sisters. And because we are his sons, if he's our father, we're his sons, Paul calls the believers sons of light. So there it all is. And there on that mountain was the son of light. There was a city that was set on the hill. There was the salt of the earth, brethren and sisters. And all those clustered around him were were sharing those wonderful attributes with him. And may it be when our Lord Jesus Christ returns to set that literal city on a hill, the city of truth, for all the world to see that we will be there, brethren and sisters, because during the course of our life, we've had a pure motive. It has salted our sacrifices before God, created peace between each other, constituting us a city set on a hill to preach the truth and in the house, proving ourselves to be sons of light of our Father which is in heaven.